Gerhard Richter, supposedly the best living painter, which I've put in um, inverted commas with a question mark. He was born in 1932 in Dresden, and he's been ranked as the most influential living contemporary artist by Art Price and Art Facts. Now, Art Price tells you the most expensive auctions of artists' work on a uh, yearly basis. And Art Facts tells you who've had the most exhibitions, and he comes near the top or at the top of those most years. So he's produced abstract and photorealistic paintings, as well as photographs and glass pieces. Some say reflects his experience of living under two oppressive regimes. The Third Reich, where his father was um, fought with the Nazis, and I suppose could have been could have been a Nazi, and then in communist East Germany, which they escaped from. So anyway, he supposedly found a, a third way uh, between realism and modernism. Now, this is the this is a piece of work which I think shows him, in both senses of the world, word in a, in the in his best light. It's called the Symphony of Light in Cologne Cathedral. Did in uh, make this is a better version of it. Um, he he didn't uh, because it, it was his adopted home, Cologne. He didn't uh, ask for any fee for it. The cost of materials and mounting the window it still came around uh, to around about. Um, 370,000 euros, but it was covered by donations from more than a thousand people. So the, the original Gothic window was there. It's a, it's a very old, um, it took, in fact, took over 600 years to fully build it, this cathedral. Um, the original Gothic window was destroyed by Allied bombing during World War II and never suitably replaced. And he, he tried to do a figurative one, which is what the, the bishop of the place wanted, um, but found none of them work. So he, he delivered this abstract combination of 11,500 identically sized units. Uh, they're com uh, frequently compared to pixels on, on a screen. They're in 72 co colors, and the arrangement was determined randomly by a computer program. And the result is a, a mesmerizing kaleidoscope blend of technology and tradition. 20 meters tall, 66 feet tall. So I think that is actually genuinely impressive. And apparently it's it's also very good because it lets lots, it lets a lot of light through into the building, which any figurative one, which would have had quite a lot of dark colors in, would have been very difficult to do. Um, just something about Cologne Cathedral. Which is one of the few places in Germany I've ever been to. It took over 600 years to build. It was bombed 14 times in World War II, but somehow stood. It houses the largest swinging church bell in the world. That's something to be Gosh. proud of, I suppose. Wow. <laughs> there are six million visitors every year. I like the reflection of the window. If you look on the walls, you can see, oh, see yes. the, the lovely yes. colours. I think that's lovely. Yes. It is. I mean, I think it is very, very impressive. This is um, one of his 1992 paintings. It's Abstractus Built, 7244. Usually he's got numbers like that. It's a squeegee painting, unusual in intensity and colour, made by applying several layers of paint onto a small canvas with a brush. He then passes a squeegee over the surface, removing layers and exposing hidden colours. As with all of his squeegee paintings, the process involves both chance and dexterity. He also did strip paintings, which I quite like the one before, but I'm not too fond of this one. Um, but it, again, he did a whole series of these. When he says 91, 9216, that means might mean the sixth variation of this. These are digital prints derived from his earlier abstract paintings. He takes a photograph of one of the paintings, then divides it into vertical slices, then stretches these slices horizontally to create long bands of colour. The result is a complex and vibrant pattern that challenges the perception of space and depth. These are ones which I, again, I prefer, just I prefer the colours in them. And these are one of his flow paintings. These are made by an, um, applying enam enamel paints onto a surface such as glass or aluminium, and then letting them move and mix freely. He uses a machine that tilts the surface at different angles and speeds, creating unpredictable flows and swirls of color. The paint is then fixed by heating or cooling the surface. 
They capture the dynamic and fluid nature of painting as well as the interplay between chance and control. It looks That's... like oil on water, doesn't it? It does. You it... know, when you see petrol on the... Yes, yes. Oh, well, I suppose it does look like flows, doesn't it? There's no doubt about yeah. it. It's flows. It's the colours. The colours the colors are amazing in that. Yeah, they are, mm. they are good, aren't they? They are good. Let's have a look at it again. Uh, yeah. Now, these are the ones that I I find perhaps most difficult to enjoy, and they're called doppelglau paintings. It's different shades of grey. He applies the enamel paint onto the glass with a brush or roller, creating subtle variations in texture and tone, then mounts the glass panels on aluminium frames and hangs them on the wall with a gap between them. They explore the minimalist and monochromatic possibilities of painting, as well as the effects of light and reflection on the glass surface. So that's there you go. There you go. So the art price and artifacts, art facts are databases that provide rankings and sale room prices and exhibition. Now these I, I got the latest ones and um it was supposed to be top of both of them, but according to Art Price in 2021, it was Picasso, Warhol, Monet, Basquiat, who I've done before, and Banksy. Um, but they, and that gives their turnover. A lot of this, of course, is about the market for art rather than art itself. But of course, that becomes important. Let's have a look at some more of them and see what I mean. This is another of his um, flow paintings. It's a diasect mounted chromogenic print. I'm sure that helps your understanding of it. Again, interesting patterns in nice, interesting colors too. Here's another flow painting executed in 2016. It's number 478 from the edition of 500. And remember, you could buy any of these 500. So you can imagine the amount of money that he is making on all this. So um, he, the, the six highest ranking artists by auction turnover and the highest ranking living European artist by auction turnover in uh, 2021. He's your highest ranking living European artist by auction turnover. And there he is standing in front of one of his paintings. This is another, is, is Abstractus Bild, 1990. It's a, it's a superlative, powerful painting from Richter's best known series. Texture, colour and structure are deployed with force and sensitivity to engender a seductive painterly synthesis comprising infinite tonal variations and abyssal layers beyond the picture plane. The balance between hard and soft, structural solidity and phosphor phosphorescence, photographic and abstract, renders the present work a remarkable exa exemplar of Richter's abstract canon. It looks like melted chocolate that someone's taken a spatula across. Or been dropped in a puddle. Yes, because it's a reflect, like a reflection. Mm. Yeah. They are, they are kind of interesting, but and, you know, there's a, a strange little flow of pattern of colours on the top left as well. Abstractus build is an exquisite demonstration of Richter's employment of the squeegee, which during the later 1980s became his principal and most highly valued tool with which to create abstract paintings. It was this tool that facilitated his desire to introduce spontaneity and chance into his creative approach. Conducted through an extensive, time-consuming, and labor-intensive process, Richter began by blending several colors to create a light ground, then would alternate between brush, palette knife, and squeegee to generate the dramatic and vibrant concoction of visual effects that we see in the present work. Measuring over two meters in height, Abstractus Build's massive presence is organized by a central axis that runs vertically down the canvas, creating two contrasting halves. There is a deep, earthy, red tone that is spread throughout the entirety of the painting, but appears most prominently around the edges of the canvas and down that central divide. Each side has been worked and reworked with layers of thick impasto, which results in two subtly different halves 
that both resonate in concert and strive against one another. The result is an exquisite painting that embodies the mature aesthetic of the artist's abstract vision and is an imperative work in his diversely abundant oeuvre. It's definitely interesting what he does. I'm still not sure what my view is of him, to be quite honest. Um, as I said, he was born in 1932. He, um, from 1957, he worked at the East German Academy of Arts on murals like Workers' Struggle, Arbeiterkampf, and oil paintings together with, and together with his wife, he escaped from East to West Germany two months before the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961. Then he was working in Dusseldorf, where the, he introduced the term capitalist realism. What was it in opposition to? Socialist realism. Remember the socialist realist, realist portraits and statutory that used to have in Eastern Europe? Well, his was a, um, as a, an, an anti-style of art. Anyway, he he resettled from Dusseldorf to, to Dusseldorf to Cologne, where he still lives and works today. That was him in 1932. He's also very keen on blur. He created. He got more and more into doing things from um, from from photographs. He explored a variety of photographic printing proce printmaking processes, but stopped and began painting from his own photos. This is one called. The Hunting Party, 1966. They look like 1960s carpets. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> I I think they're more impressive as a group than as individual yeah. um, paintings. You know, when you were looking around, the, showing us the gallery, they yeah. actually look quite dramatic and quite good in the gallery yeah. because and they were with similar works. So that, anyway, those is images of abstract painting. They look like forests and some of them. Some of them are more interesting than others, I think. Yes, I, I mean, like, this is an interesting. It strikes me as fairly arbitrary what the result that he gets. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like I like this one. I like I like. Yes, this, I yeah. like that one. An image of the British monarch Elizabeth II, who I'm sure you can recognise through the blur. The picture was taken from a newspaper and rephotographed by the artist. Like one of my photographs, though. <laughs> <laughs> out, out of focus. <laughs> yeah, or with rain dribbling over the lens. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was re-photographed by the artist. The grey in the image resembles the black and white photograph from which the piece derives. Hmm. Well, there you go. Here's a self-portrait, or self-portrait, self-portrait by him. His fundamental aversion to all beliefs and ideology, ideologies turned Richter against the capitalist West. He was particularly put off by the cults of personalities surrounding his contemporaries. It was Kunstschleiser, he later, great word that, isn't it? He later complained, artist bullshit. And he was condemning a lot of the pop artists of the time. By 1962, Richter had enough of all this bloody painting and burned all his own old work. Photographs were the way forward. <laughs> Looks like an image on the Turin shroud, doesn't it? That sort of this one. It's holds... a bit of a one-trick pony, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. He's got lots of different tricks, but you know, they they uh, pretty random what they seem to come up with. Horse... No, this this blurred. Oh, the blurred the thing. Yeah, realistic yeah. Realistic photography. Painting. Well, they they sell for quite a lot. Um, Horsed with dog, nineteen sixty-four. A photo portrait in black and white in which Richter's father, identified only by his first name, appears obscured by, obscured by horizontal streaks like lines of TV static. Richter renders Horst at once hideous and pitiable, a Dr. Caligari double whose rumpled clothes suggest he is down on his look. The pet simpers on his knee, make, simpering on his knee makes him all the more grotesque. Here's an interesting one. Sonic Youth, Daydream Nation. Um, they used a painting of his for the cover art of their album, Daydream Nation, in 1988. He was a fan of the band and didn't charge for the use of the image. This is one of his abstract canvases. It was sold by Eric Clapton to a telephone bidder for $34.2 million in 2012. 
Now this is another. This is another of his most famous ones, which is that. Does everybody remember the Bader Meinhof gang, who um, were were kind of led a, a terrorism against capitalism in West Germany, and they were eventually they did various bombings and things, and they were eventually captured, and some of them killed in the capturing. So this was this is a take on this. I think Richter's October eighteenth, nineteen seventy seven cycle of paintings is among the most significant works made during the second half of the 20th century. My name is Paulina Poboja, and I'm an associate curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. I think one of the best ways to understand this work is Richter's attempt at a contemporary history painting. History painting is a genre that dates back centuries um, in the history of art, but one that maybe is less frequently seen in contemporary painting. And he's taken this subject matter and across these 15 canvases really created a work that is very much about the events themselves, but also about remembrance, about reflection. And the central subject matter here is one of tremendous import for the post-war period of West Germany. He's featuring episodes from the Bader Meinhof gang, as they're often called, or the Red Army Faction, which was a leftist organization that waged a campaign of violence against the German state beginning in the late 1960s and continuing through the 1990s. And he's really honed in on particular moments, the arrests and then subsequent deaths of several founding members of the Bader Meinhof gang. There are tremendous suspicions surrounding the deaths of these, these individuals. Three people died on October 18th, 1977. The deaths were reported as suicides, but suspicion has hung over that determination ever since. And say hello to people. I've, I've, I've gained an audience here. Come on, just turn, come over here. Come here, say hello. Wait, wait. Hello. 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 Uh, to, uh, Bernard, it's, it's interesting that uh, you focused entirely on his abstract painting when uh, there is a huge uh, way, uh, a, a plethora of, of beautifully done specific photographic art, which requires enormous skill, just as all this does. And, uh, you know, do you, do we, we want to end up defining, okay, clear up, clear up, uh, you know, defining what artists or composers or writers, what they do in terms of the products that are sold. And uh, and often the art, well, most of the time, the artist has no control on on the 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 value the fiscal value of things and how they're done that's an entire army of of agents and sellers and buyers and it has to be said lots of people with great amounts of money who don't want to give it to the tax man and the, and put it into the the ownership of art instead so it's not the artist's uh, responsibility for for that I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a way of seeing. It's, it, it takes enormous skill and thought and presence to, to, to follow this pattern. I'm, I'm glad you've given that interpretation, Bill. Also, the fact is that he has made an enormous amount of money from this. He is a technical innovator. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, sure. And he certainly gives you cause for thought. But I didn't feel, find myself, and this is probably my fault, I didn't find myself warming to him. But you have to know to, to be able to warm to any any creative process, you have to understand all the aspects of the of, of that individual's creativity. As I say, you don't have to like it. You don't have to like it, that's the thing. No, absolutely. No, it's not to do with like, but it's it's to do with understanding why anybody would spend their life doing the thing that they do. I see a piece of art and it speaks to me. It doesn't matter what classification it comes into. And I don't need to know mm. about the artist and mm. what went into it. Subsequently, I may be that interested that I research that, and that gains my interest in and of itself. Mm. But I don't need to know that first off. I was surprised. I didn't really know about him. I think I'd heard the name, and that was about it. Yeah. And yet, he is a leading. What, whichever way you want to look at it, he is an important modern artist. 
There's mm. no doubt about that. I just feel that when you're searching for it, I've never seen anybody so in, so covered in copyrights and um, uh, thing you know things stopping and the amounts of money that have been made out of each one. It's his his capitalist realism is that his paintings are capitalist realism are very much parts of a capitalist market which look at the price of things. There's Burton irony there, isn't there? I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's he's certainly worth a look at. But it, I think it also because his story isn't a straightforward one. If you're looking at somebody like Van Gogh, it might be a tragic story, but it's a clear story that you're looking at of an individual, and you you can you can feel about it and relate it to the paintings very easily. Whereas relating the man to the paintings he makes here, I find quite difficult. Yeah, the ah, Aviva, Aviva International. Oh, Aviva. Oh. Yes, they, they paint. Is that the factory, the new, yeah. what do you call it, art sensor? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen it from the outside. It's yeah. uh, kind of weird. But, uh, yeah. that, there's some great stuff going on in there, but everybody is talking about the fact they do not like that Aviva has suddenly come along and and because they put 35 yeah. million into it. The because they, they, they want to retain just Factory International. Yeah, well, Tony it, Wilson set up factory years ago. It's called yeah, yeah. Cap capitalist realism, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. Okay, Maureen, do, what did you like the paintings by um yeah? It, it was interesting. I, I did like the blend of colours. Some of them I found myself my eye was following a particular line of blue or something. I, yeah. I don't know it was, but I know what this is gonna kind of sound silly, but um a few years back before I was in IKEA. I'd suddenly look across and a, a painting would just draw me to it. Yeah, I've got a, a couple in here and I don't know why, but there's just something about me mm -hmm. looking at mm -hmm. that and I just got have to have it. So it's just what, I, sometimes it's like um, evokes feelings in you when you see a particular colour, I think, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. that's exactly it, isn't it? You see something, it grabs you yeah, like for it, whatever yeah. reason, you know, for mm. or to, to, that's it's, it's, a, it's a lovely feeling mm. that is. Yeah. It's some emotion, isn't it? That's the. Uh, yes. The, yeah, I think so. Anyway, we're in the last minute now, so we'll be all. Yeah, that was lovely, Bernard. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.